there. Good evening, everybody. Uh, today, uh, we actually get to finish a whole Sefer of Tanakh. Amazing, because the smallest, uh, the shortest Sefer in Tanakh is Sefer Ovadja, which is only 20 psukim, and that happens to be the Haftorah for uh, Parshas Svayishlach. So today, we could actually make a siyam. We should have brought refreshments and, and the like, because a siyam on Nach, you're permitted to, to treat like a siyam on Mishnah. Uh, but before we get into the Haftorah, I do want to talk a little bit about the, the Parsha and the connection to the Haftorah. Uh, the Parsha is the long-awaited, the long-anticipated Pegisha between Yaakov and Esav. Yaakov has been gone for many, many years, for more than three decades. Uh, for some reason, Esav did not pursue him in Lavan's house, although Esav knew where he was. But he figured if Yaakov is not taking advantage of the brachos anyway, so I'll leave him alone. Perhaps Yaakov abdicated but Yaakov is coming back. And uh, Yaakov sends Esav a bunch of gifts. And then he hears that Esav is coming with 400 soldiers to uh, kill him. Now, it's a very important to understand that the reference to Esav taking the 400 men is only after Yaakov sent the gifts. Until Yaakov sent the gifts, we don't hear about Esav coming after him. The gift giving was not a response to any threat from Esav. It was what you might call a preemptive attempt to appease Esav, but the question is whether that backfired in and of itself. So really, Chazal looked at the whole interaction of Yaakov and Esav in many, many different ways. There is one of you in Chazal that says it was entirely improper for Yaakov to even approach Esav. And it quotes a pasuk in Mishlei that says, Machzik v'yoznei kelev over misaber b'riv lo uh, he who gets involved in stirring up a quarrel that he not, doesn't need to get involved in is like a person who pulls up the ears of a sleeping dog. In English we have an expression, let sleeping dogs lie. That's exactly what the Pasuk is saying. That in a sense, Yaakov incited the jealousy of Esav. In other words, by Yaakov sending his possessions, although he did so in the guise of a gift, he's kind of rubbing Esav's nose and saying, look at how successful I was. And that brings back all sorts of bad memories, bad associations. It rekindles the anger. Now, it turned out at the end, so to speak, Esau did not carry out anything, but at least initially, uh, it was Yaakov's ostentatiousness that actually stimulated uh, Esau's uh, initial negative reaction. And uh, the Soporno says that indeed, this has been the problem of Jewish people when they try to show off their wealth, the Eine HaGoyim, there will often be a negative reaction. So according to one view, Yaakov is faulted for at least unintentional ostentation, may unintention, there's such a phrase, unintentional arrogance, so to speak, that he's making himself look too good, and that, uh, that invites the jealousy and the animosity of the Yomot Olam. You should know that in Europe, at the time of the Maral and the like, that Maral himself was an author of them, there was a whole category of takanos, of kihilot, that were called anti-sumptuary laws that limited conspicuous uh, consumption or expenses of weddings and, and the like. And uh, a lot of this was that the Umota alum should not be jealous over Jewish people showing off their wealth and the like. Now, of course, what happened was this was abused, as it is today, because it became a revenue-raising uh, device, meaning to say, if you want to have more than 200 guests at your chasna, you will have to pay the kahal, you know, a certain amount of money for every extra guest. So instead of deterring people, it just meant that if you were rich, you just paid the extra money. Uh, but in theory, it was designed to deter conspicuous uh, consumption. Question? Yeah. Isn't there a... Um, uh dramatic difference between con conspicuous consumption and donations either to your enemy or to the doctor? No, that's very enemy. true, but, but, but uh, I'm just drawing an analogy. I mean, the, the point that the Medrash is making is that if Yaakov would have just come back quietly, if Yaakov wouldn't have even have announced, if Yaakov just would have done his own thing and not necessarily tried to demonstrate to Esau how successful he was, Esau might have dropped. Uh, Yaakov would have said, I'll leave him alone. Uh, what, you know, what's gone is gone, what's, so it's water under the, bri uh, under the bridge or, or whatever. Now, there's an, yeah. It's, 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 it's sort of a strange idea. Yeah. Uh, but Rashi says, oh, the Pasuk says, but Gam hu hoi lech trosko, ba'abad me'ez kishtimo, 
Okay. Yeah. And that's it. And then the apple says, "Hati leni nami adoti ni adiso." Yes. So that and that's before the Yaakov stopped getting presents. Well, no, not not really, because uh, maybe it's before the actual gift giving, but it's not before Yaakov's statement, because the parsha begins initially. Vayishlach Yaakov Melachim Lefanav El Esav Achiv. He sent messengers to Esav in which he describes, I have Shor, Vachamor, I have all of these different things. Rashi interprets it being one. And it's not the Shmami Sorry, no, sorry. Rashi said here it's a plural, but he also, Rashi also says yeah. that this is not the Shmami you know, yeah. Well, well uh, listen. I mean, I mean, there are there are many, many different shots. All, all I'm yes. saying is, I'm, I'm I'm quoting you a medrash, which is yes, a view that says that Yaakov stirred up the trouble. Indeed. Now, there is another view that also says Yaakov stirred up trouble in an opposite direction, and that is he was too subservient. He was too subordinate to Esau. Mm-hmm. He referred to himself as Avdecha, mm-hmm. your servant, your slave. And he called himself Eved as seven times, eight times, eight times. And indeed, the Medrash comments, another Medrash comments, that we read at the end of Parshas Vayishlach, that there were eight kings who ruled in Edom, in the Edomite territory of Esau, before there was ever a king in Am Yisrael. And, uh, of course, that creates a historical problem of when was that written, because that refers to the period after Moshe Rabbeinu. That's, okay, that's a... A separate question: The Eben Ezra, who sometimes <coughs> has a position that certain non-halachic psukim may have been added at a later date, uh, which is a very daring idea. Uh, others simply say the Torah is being prophetic, which is, is the, the normal way we'd understand it. But be it as it may, the Medrash says because Yaakov debased himself to a Russia, and because he called himself your slave eight times. In effect, Edom had an ascendancy over uh, Aklal Yisrael for eight generations, besides what happened much later during the Bayat Shani. Uh, in fact, uh, there's another Medrash, and actually it's a Gemara as well, that says Amalek can only be defeated by the children of Rachel and cannot be defeated by the children of Leah. And you actually see this historically. The first war against Amalek, right after we left Mitzrayim, Amalek was the first nation that attacked us. Mm-hmm. Moshe appointed Hoshea bin Nun, who later became Yehoshua, to be his uh, warrior, to be the general. And what tribe is Yehoshua bin Nun from? The tribe of Ephraim, which is from Yosef, which is from <laughs> Rachel. The very first king of the Jewish people before David HaMelech was Shaul from the tribe of Binyamin, who is from Rachel, and what was Shaul's primary mission, which he didn't fulfill totally, mm-hmm. the destruction of Amalek in Purim, which represents the reenactment of the struggle against Amalek, which is Haman. The protagonists are Mordechai and Esther, mm-hmm. who are from Binyamin. And finally, before we have the Mashiach ben David that will redeem the Jewish people, there is the enigmatic Mashiach ben Yosef, who will be killed in the war of Gog and Magog, but one of the roles of Mashiach ben Yosef is to be instrumental in the downfall of Amalek. You see, in other words, a consistent pattern, and I'll connect it to this in a moment, that Amalek gets defeated by Zera Rachel, either Yosef or Binyamin, and not Zera Leah. And by the way, that is actually seen in the Haftarah itself. The Haftarah, I'll, I'll go back to the general Haftarah in a moment, but the Haftarah is a description of the eventual defeat of Edom. And it mentions, Fahaya base Yaakov Eish. The house of Yaakov shall be a fire. U base Yosef Lehava. And the house of Yosef shall be a torch, a flame. U base Esav Lakash. And the house of Esav will be straw that will be consumed by the flame. And in direct proximity, what flame will consume uh, the house of Esav? Base Yosef, the house of Yosef, which is Zerah Rachel. Now, what is so magical about Zerah Rachel? There are a lot of different reasons. One is the uh, Rachel's love and compassion for her sister, her willingness to give up Yaakov. But someone will learn the following, that all of the Shvatim bowed down to Esau with uh, acceptance. 
except for Yosef, who stood up to defend his mother, and Binyamin, who was not born yet. So there is this concept. You subordinate yourself to the Russia. The Russia has power over you. Amalek comes from Esau. Amalek is the grandson of Esau. Esau had a son, Eliphaz, and Eliphaz uh, had a mistress, a Pilegesh Timna, and Amalek comes from Timna. So it's only Zerah Rachel that is immune from the Koach of Amalek because it is only Zerah Rachel that never made themselves subordinate to the Koach of Esau. So you see two different views in Chazal. Was Yaakov too show offy, too arrogant, or at least you know, too ostentatious? Or was Yaakov too submissive? But the common denominator between the two views is he shouldn't have done what he did. He should have just been quiet. He should not stir up a sleeping dog when a dog is asleep, right? If a dog is asleep, even if it's a friendly dog like a Labrador Retriever or a Beagle, like you pull it up by the ears, you know, it's going to bite you. You know, what are you, what are you bothering a sleeping dog? However, there's yet a third view in the Gemara that we actually derive very constructive lessons from what Yaakov did. The Gemara in Sanhedrin tells us that before the Chachamim would go, uh, before he would go to negotiate on behalf of the Jewish people with Rome, which we believe is descended from Asa, that's why we call the Roman Empire the Golos of Edom, so he would study the lessons of Vayishlach to understand strategically what is the best way that you approach a potentially hostile entity. And they identified that Yaakov Avinu employed three major strategies. A very famous statement in the Gemara. On one hand, there was reconciliation, gift-giving, submissiveness, showing that I love you and I care about you and I respect you. That's one approach. On the other hand, if that fails, you have to be ready for war if that becomes necessary. And the third, which is the most important of all, is you turn to HaKadosh Baruch Hu B'Tfilah, that you'll be successful in whatever particular path you have to go. Without HaKadosh Baruch Hu, there's not going to be any success. So these are the uh, three major steps. Uh, you try for peace, reconciliation, friendship. You are prepared for war if necessary, and you turn to HaKadosh Baruch Hu for Siyat HaDishmaya in whichever path you wind up having to, to choose. So I would I'd like to just offer a homiletical extension to this, that this is not limited uh, ex- uh, only to the particular encounter with Asaph, but in a sense, these are three different ways that we relate to a secular culture in modern times. And that is, I know we live in a world which is largely not committed to Torah. First of all, the vast majority are not Jewish at all, and and most Jews are not uh, fully committed to Torah yet, and and the like. And the question is, uh, if a person wants to keep the Torah, a person wants to raise their family in accordance with the Torah values, how is one mitiaches, how does one relate to a secular society? Now, there may be two opposite approaches that people have. Some people basically take the attitude that anything that is outside of the four walls of the Beit HaMedrash is puzzle, treif, I want nothing to do with it. There is nothing the outside world offers to me. There is nothing of value. Homiletically, we might call that waging war against the Aesop of the world. I reject it. It is totally invalid. There are others who want to be universalists. They want to be people of the world. They want to embrace everything. So essentially, the dialectic of Yaakov Avinu teaches us that neither approach by itself is entirely a good approach. Uh, and that is, Chazal do tell us, <coughs> if someone tells you, Chachma Bagayim, there is wisdom, there is insight among the Gentiles of the world. Ta'amin, you believe them. There is insight. To simply say that the collective accomplishments of the human race outside of the Jews who are learning Torah are simply worthless and have no nothing to teach you is actually not true. There is Chachma Bagoyim. The great Balmusser, Rav Shlomo Valba, uh, when he was a young man and he was in Switzerland during World War II, he managed to escape from Germany to Switzerland, 
So he was very interested in Musser. He was interested in personality development. He was interested in how do you become a moral person? How do you become a good person? So it happened to be that in Geneva at the time was uh, really the world's greatest expert in uh, child psychology and how children develop a sense of val uh, values. That was Jean Piaget, not, not Jewish. And because Rav Volvo was interested in how Midos Tovos are developed, he apprenticed himself. He became a research assistant uh, to Dr. Piaget for a few months. And he felt that that was very, very helpful in his understanding the dynamic of character building and personality development. Right? That's Chachma Bagayim, Chachma Bagayim Tamit. So, essentially, what Yaakov Avinu was telling us is <coughs> that part of what's out there we need to affirmatively embrace and bring in. Gift-giving, welcoming. Part of it, we have to have the fortitude to reject and say no. And how do you know what to accept and what to reject? That comes through prayer, where you get to connect to Hashem and you get to know yourself as well because it's a very difficult uh, decision to make. You know, it is relatively easy to always have an all-or-nothing approach. If my position is everything out there is good, okay, that's how I live. Everything out there is bad, that's a little harder, but you know, that's at least you have a relatively clear <coughs> demarcation point. But to, come to understand some is good and some is bad, and some benefits and brings me closer to Hashem, and some really destroys and impairs that relationship. That takes discrimination, that takes wisdom, that takes subtlety. That's not an easy thing. And that's why, in a sense, I can understand the position that rejects everything, because that position basically says the dangers are too much. Although the truth of the matter is, uh, there's no such thing as rejecting everything. I mean, you know, people, if, you, if you have a cell phone, you're using something that was invented by the non-Jewish culture, although some people are against mm -hmm. cell phones too, but okay. Um, you know, so there's no such thing as, as, as a total rejection of everything, but I do understand the notion that the fear of modernity is so great that as a matter of the lesser of two evils, I want to have a very, very little part of it. But the insight is, it is still the lesser of two evils. It is not the absolute good. The much higher level is to be able to integrate. And this we see uh, from the bracha that Noah gave his third son, Yefes. Uh, if you remember, uh, when Noah got drunk after the flood, so his nakedness was exposed, and uh, Cham was mocking him, according to Chazal, Cham may have castrated him, and even worse things. Uh, and Shame and Yefes walked backwards with a cover, and they covered the nakedness of Noah, and they did not gaze at it. And uh, because they respected him, Noah gave Yefes a bracha, and the bracha says, Yaf delokim li yefes, God shall give beauty to Yefes, the Yishkon be Shem, and he will dwell in the tents of Shem. Now in English that sounds bad, but remember Shem is a name, so it is a positive thing. He shall dwell in the tent of Shem. So here is what Rav Shem Shunafal Hirsch said, and of course uh, you're going to say that he's biased because he, he is the great espouser of Torah in Derech Eretz, but this is in fact one of his main source texts. He says that Shem and Yefes had two different missions in the world, and this was passed <coughs> down to their progeny. Shem is the one who brings God into the world, who spreads the message of holiness, spirituality, morality, restraint, limitation on power. Right? Shem is, of course, the ancestor of Avram. The very word Semite comes from shame, shame and the like. So shame is given the mission of godliness and kedusha. Yefes, who was the ancestor of Yavan, Greece, represents the idea of beauty, but beauty in many, many different realms. There is the physical beauty of sculpture and architecture, and even the athleticism of the human body. There is the beauty of logic and geometry, right? If, you, if you're into math, you see a beauty, some people might find it very odd, but you see a beauty and elegance in geometry and the like. Mm -hmm. Literature, philosophy, of course. Uh, you know, the Greek, Greek philosophy has a very long history, even before Aristotle. When people think of Greek philosophy, they, 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 they typically only know two names, uh, maybe three names, Socrates, uh, Plato, and Aristotle, but they were literally, although they are probably the most esteemed, but they are the 
tip of the iceberg. There was a huge iceberg of hundreds of years of philosophical thought. So Yavan represents, and Yepes represents, the epitome of beauty in all spheres, the epitome of human accomplishment and productivity in literature, architecture, art, philosophy, science. <clears throat> so what is Noah saying? Noah is giving that blessing of beauty to Yepes. But he's saying, but when is it beautiful? When it dwells within the confines of shame, godliness, morality, and moral constraint. When Yefes uncouples itself from the tense of shame, then it becomes destructive and abusive. And indeed, the Maharal much earlier points out that the word noi, noi is beauty, has the same letters as Yavan, Greece. But Yavan, Yud Vav Nun, is a Hebrew Shorish that actually means oppression. It is connected to Onaa, Onat, right? So beauty, when it is uncoupled from godliness, can turn into a very destructive force. Uh, it becomes egotistical, and it becomes a thirst for power and domination in different ways in which when man puts himself as the center of all things, inevitably there will be abuses that will take place. Now, in a way, this is really the story of Hanukkah. Right? Hanukkah is the story of the fight against the oven. And of course, of course, we have to remember that although Antiochus had many anti-Semitic decrees against the fulfillment of the Torah, or at least anti-Torah decrees, he actually was not anti-Semitic in a racial sense, but anti-religious decrees. But you have to remember that, as a matter of fact, most of the Jewish people had gone along with his agenda way before he made those gazeros. The process of Hellenization in the aftermath of Alexander of Macedon's conquest was largely a voluntary process. Jew many Jews, similar to today, assimilated, they went with the plan, and they did not look at the Maccabees as heroes. They looked at the Maccabees as fanatics, who were simply making life difficult for them and they basically would say you know why don't you be you know just like somebody might say why don't you be a 21st century person so they would say uh, you know be a first century uh, you know bce citizen of the world meaning to say why are you living this primitive way so essentially the maccabees the chashmonayim the maccabim the relatively few few numbers of jews i mean some have said it, uh, the, the, those who were faithful to the Torah at that time were as small as 10%. And some have even given a number of only a thousand Jews. It is quite, quite astounding that Judaism's survival depended on a thousand people standing up for the Torah against the Greek Empire, Antiochus' Syrian Empire. Which technically wasn't from Greece at that point, but you know, it was uh, the spiritual descendant of Alexander. Seleucus Empire in Syria. So, on one hand, it is a fight against Greek culture, but it's a fight against Greek culture when it is uncoupled from spirituality. But it is not a fight against the idea that Chachma Bagayim Tamin, Chachma Bagayim Tamin. So, that's one thing to look at in terms of the notion that there is much uh, good in the world. You know, those of you that had the privilege of um, knowing, or at least learning from, uh, Rav Aaron Lichtenstein, Zechariah uh, Lebracha, would know that uh, he was a person who uh, taught this all the time. He had a PhD in English literature from Harvard. And in fact, his expertise was actually some Christian polemical literature, John Milton and, and, and the like. And yet he was a person who was totally devoted to Limud HaTorah, really Yom Belayla and Midos Tovos and the like. And uh, although he was not a proselytizer, he would not tell somebody go to get a PhD in something. But he did draw on even his secular knowledge to enhance his avodas Hashem because he saw a whole world and everything in the world can be used in a positive way uh, to become closer to Hashem. This is what Shlomo HaMelech says when he says, B'chol jirachecha da'eyu Know Hashem in all of your ways, all of your encounters. There's even a journal, I think by Ilan published it, it's called the BDD Journal. It stands for Bechal Zerachah They They use that uh, to kind of uh, 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 articulate that particular, that particular agenda. 
Uh, one other thing in the parsha before I, I get to the Haftorah, that is, uh, Yaakov, when Yaakov prays, Yaakov says, Hatsileni na miyad ochi miyad esav. Save me from my brother, the hand of my brother, the hand of Esav. So the question is very obvious. Yaakov only has one brother. What is the superfluous reference? Save me from my brother, save me from Esav. So there's a famous verse, a famous thought from the Beis HaLevi that says Yaakov is afraid of two different things. On one hand, Yaakov is afraid of the Esav that wants to kill him. Yes, indeed. But Yaakov is equally afraid of the Esav that comes in the guise of a friendly brother. Because if the Esav that comes to kill him will afflict the body, the Esav that comes to the, as a brother may destroy the soul. Assimilation, intermarriage, losing your values, losing your moral compass. In fact, that's why Yaakov was so afraid of being in Lovin's house, or he had been so afraid of being in Lovin's house, because of the undermining of values. You know, in the 19th century, when Napoleon was going through Europe, and his last major campaign, of course, was uh, against Russia, and uh, he was ultimately defeated, but uh, there was a machlokas among the Hasidic Rebbe's in Russia and Poland. Should we pray for Napoleon's victory, or should we pray for the victory of the Tsar? Now, at that time, Jewish, Jewish life in Tsarist Russia was tremendously oppressive. Uh, the taxation was exorbitant. Jews were poverty-stricken. They were confined to only a small area as the Pale of Settlement, which constantly changed, so you often had to uproot your home with 24 hours of notice. <coughs> there was the Cantonists, in which children were forcibly taken into the army at the age of 8, 8 to 10, and had to stay in the army for 30 years. And this was so bad that, that parents would sometimes literally amputate fingers off their children so their children could get an exemption from uh, this military service, which was awful, awful. Now, Napoleon, on the other hand, did promise, and he delivered, to a large degree, emancipation, that Jews would have civil and political rights, they would be able to attend university, uh, they, would have, uh, they would have access to professions, they could be doctors, they could be lawyers. So, many Hasidic rabbis, or many rabbis, they took the attitude, well, Baruch Hashem, Napoleon will give us freedom, and with freedom there will be less oppression, life will be better. So the one dissenting opinion, very famous Hasidic Rebbe, this was the Balatanya, the first Lubavitch Rebbe, who actually said, you know, we're better off with the Tsar than Napoleon, because the Tsar makes our life miserable. But the one thing we can't do in Russia is we can't assimilate, they don't let us, they don't want us. As a result, we are spiritually strong and spiritually vibrant. What's going to happen when all the barriers are pulled down and Jews could do anything that they want? They could become whatever they want, although it was somewhat of an exaggeration, but at least in theory, that's what Napoleon promised. At that point, they're going to abandon uh, Judaism. There's going to be intermarriage, assimilation, and the like. So because of this, it is recorded that the Balatanya actually raised money for the Tsar's army, and after Napoleon was defeated, I think the Schneerson family got a medal or an award from the Tsar for their service in helping the military effort. Now, a hundred years later, the Russian Revolution, that was an excuse that the communists used to uh, you know, harass Chabad, among other reasons, but they said, you are imperialists, you are counter-revolutionaries, uh, and the like. They actually used it uh, against them uh, in, a negative, in a negative way. Now, it is very true, and the truth of the matter is the Alter Rebbe's prediction was actually correct because uh, if, you, if, you, if you correlate developments like the reform movement and, and the like, they really do follow uh, the, the aftermath of the French Revolution, emancipation, uh, Napoleon uh, opening the ghettos of Europe, etc. And uh, therefore it is very, very true that as sad as it is to say, we don't do that well with freedom. You know, obviously we would hope to have an easier life, a more comfortable life, a more affluent life. You know, we, we, we would like that. And, you know, Bezra Sashem, you know, we should all be zolcha to that. But the truth of the matter is, with affluence often comes an abandonment of a strong connection to Torah. I mean, even in a pragmatic way, if uh, in the middle of Tsarist Russia you were a bright, smart, intelligent person, uh, what else could you do 
but learn Gemara. There wasn't a lot of other avenues that were open. So as a result, the best and the brightest became great Talmudei Chachamim. When all of the options are open, then obviously you know, people are going to go in other directions, right? Now, now, granted, one shouldn't just learn Torah because they're smart and they have nothing else to do, but nevertheless, uh, for some, that was a motivator and that, that produced great Talmudei Chachamim. So there is that, that idea that Yaakov is afraid not only of the Esau that wants to kill him, but Yaakov is afraid of the Esau that comes in the guise of a brother. One more segment uh, on this. Vayira Yaakov ma'od vayetzarlo. Yaakov was very afraid and Yaakov was distressed. Again, you have a double language. Right? What is vayitzar vayira? So Rashi's language is Vayira Yaakov Ma'od. One second here. Rashi says Vayira Shema Yeharek, lest he be killed. Vayetzarlo, he was very distressed. Im Yaharoku Esoacherim, lest he kill others. Now, this is a bit reminiscent, Lahabdil, I say Lahabdil, of Golda Meir's famous remark, which, you know, or infamous remark, depending on how you look at it, where Golda Meir once said that we can forgive the Arabs for killing our children. And I, I don't accept that, but this is what she said. We can, but we cannot forgive the Arabs for making us kill their children. Oh. Now, the first half, you know, again, many people uh, feel was a very hurtful thing to say. But the second half has a certain resonance in our tradition. If you remember, by Kriyas Yamsuf itself, when the Egyptians were drowning, and the Malachi Asharites wanted to praise the Almighty, so HaKadosh Baruch Hu said, this is not a time for joy, and it's not a time for jubilation. My creatures are drowning in the sea. I'm not pacifist, and we're not pacifist. Habal Laharkechat, somebody is coming to kill you, you kill them. But you don't kill them with joy and enthusiasm. You kill them with sadness. Because they too were made in the image of God. And they too had the potential, had the potential to be good. And if they became Rishaim that had to be destroyed, that is not a cause for joy. That is a cause for sadness. And uh, Yaakov Avinu was expressing this idea, according to Rashi, which is from Chazal, that my fear is I'll get killed. But I'm also distressed if I have to kill and destroy others because a Jew does not get pleasure in the downfall of the enemy. Uh, this is the Pasuk in Mishlei again, which the Medrash quotes on this. The downfall of your enemy, do not rejoice. And there's a famous, beautiful word from Rav Kook. You know, Shimon Esrei originally had 18 brachos. That's why it's called Shimon Esrei. But then, Rabbi Gamliel, after the Chorban, Rabbi Gamliel added, or he needed to add, an extra blessing, number 19, against the heretics and against the missionaries and against those who do bad things to the Jewish people. But he was looking for an author who is able to write a bracha against the heretics and missionaries. And he finally identified a rabbi who was called Shmuel HaKadon, Shmuel the modest, the humble. And Shmuel HaKatan was the author of what is called Birkat Saminim, the blessing against the heretics. So Rav Kook asks in his uh, parish on the Siddur, what's the big deal? I mean, who wrote? I mean the same way you wrote, you wrote the other ones, uh, write this one. What is so special about this one? And what is so special about Shmuel HaKatan? So Rav Kook said that the bracha of Lomal Shinim al Tikva is very unique. Because every bracha in the Amida asks Hashem to give us something good. Refuah, Painasa. <coughs> this is the only bracha that asks Hashem to punish and destroy and wipe out. Now here, Rav Kook says the following. When you ask God to punish and destroy, you can't be motivated out of hatred, bitterness, and animosity. You have to be motivated out of a greater love for the Jewish people in which because of my love for Am Yisrael and because of my love of Hashem, 
I want these impediments to be removed. But it doesn't become a personal animosity. So Rabbi Gamil's problem is, when we look at the missionaries and the Romans and the Christians, it's not even clear exactly who the exact target is, who is capable of not feeling personal hatred and resentment? But you can't come to God with that attitude. So what's so great about Shmuel HaKatan? Perki Avos quotes Shmuel HaKatan, Hu Haya Omer, this was his mission statement, and it's not even his, it's a Pasuk, but he used to say it all the time, Binafol HaYevecha Al Titzmach, when your enemy has a downfall, do not rejoice, only that person is the person who can do Birkat Samina, because he's not acting out of hatred, he's acting out of a greater love for Amisa. Now again, I, I don't want to. Okay, I mean, I don't want to be guilty of, of the same offense. But you know, when you consider, for example, the um, the demonstrations that are going on uh, here in Yerushalayim by uh, by a certain by a certain group, you know, I couldn't get. Well, okay, <laughs> I'm a little upset because I, I could literally could not get to a chasna Sunday night that I had to get to oh. uh, because I couldn't get a cab. I was at the central bus station. And uh, I waited over an hour, whatever it is. I, uh, you know, so so the demonstration was my free on me. But again, but I'm only a tiny little thing. But uh, ambulances couldn't get through, etc. But you see that I, I mean I can't I can't give you the motivation of everybody. But but overall, the overall impression just by watching it is that this was treated like a game. This was treated as fun. This was treated as a break from the base measures. This was not something in which we love the Jewish people so much that we're hoping and we're praying that the Torah will be increased in Am Yisrael, etc. It wasn't, it wasn't that way. And uh, once again, uh, you know, if one is engaged in a demonstration of this type, you've got to come because of your love for Hashem and your love for Am Yisrael and your care and your concern, whether you're right or wrong on the underlying issue, that's a separate matter. It isn't because oh, these are chilonim or goyim and, and blah, 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 blah. And because then you're acting out of hatred, you're acting out of resentment, and that is not a proper motive, even against people that you consider are not halakhically following the right path, even if you consider that way. That's what Rav Cook says, and Rav Cook, Rav Cook, of course, exemplified this in his own life. Rav Cook said, it is the way of the wise to, to generate light and not to curse darkness to create wisdom and not to criticize folly. That, you know, you create goodness in the world by creating goodness, not by so much fighting, criticizing, and demeaning what other people are doing. That's a little bit of an editorial comment. Okay, so these are some connections in the, in the Parsha. Now, the Haftarah is the entire book of Ovadja. Ovadja, of course, is a, is a name that itself means servant of God. And Ovadia has his own book, the shortest book in Tanakh. It's uh, one of the twelve smaller prophets, and it's only one peric. But actually, Ovadia, the name Ovadia, is mentioned in the book of Malachim. So the whole Machlokas is this the same person? Uh, but it says that Ovadia was a servant. He was the chief uh, butler, so to speak, of Achav, Melech Yisrael. And Ovadia, at his own expense, maintained 100 prophets at a time when Achav had a death sentence on anyone that was a Navi. And Ovadja, at great personal risk and at great expense, but it's, but more than, it's more than the money, he was putting his own life in danger, took care of uh, 100 Nevi'im. In fact, Chazal take it further. If you recall, when Elisha resurrected the uh, child, I'm sorry, when Eliel rather resurrected the child of a widow, the child that died, according to Chazal, she was the widow of Avadja because she said to Eliyahu, you know that my husband was Yorea Hashem, my husband had Yirat Hashem, Minu Urav from his youth. Chazal say that's none other than this great man Avadja. Now this places Avadja much, much earlier because that means if Avadja is in Achaz's time, that means he was way before the destruction of the first base. And he was way before the exile of the ten tribes. Now, since Ovadia does make repeated references to the destruction of the base of Mikdash, then obviously you'd have to understand this literally as 
he is describing a future that he did not yet experience. The alternative would be it's a different Ovadja and it's much, uh, it's much later. And Chazal say, why was Ovadja given the mission of prophesying about the eventual downfall of Edom? Because Ovadja lived with two Rishayim, Achav and Izeba, and he did not learn from their bad deeds. Therefore, he gives Musr to Esav, who lived with two tzaddikim, Yitzchak and Rivka, mm. and didn't learn from their good deeds. It's exactly the opposite. Esav had wonderful environment and didn't learn. Ovadja had very, very bad environment and didn't learn. So they both, neither of them learned from their environment, but in opposite, in opposite directions. According to yet another Chazal, Ovadja was not even born Jewish. Ovadja, in fact, was a Gertzenek. Ovadja was a non-Jew who became Jewish, and some say he himself came from Edom. He was an Edomite. So once again, uh, he is chosen to be the, the vehicle. Now, what Ovadja describes is he describes how Edom uh, was jubilant as the Jewish people were suffering. Now, contextually, he is not describing the destruction of the Second Temple. I mean, the Second Temple was destroyed by Edom, Rome. But he is describing the Edomite reaction to the suffering of the Jewish people at the time of the first Beis HaMikdash. Now, Edom at that time was a relatively insignificant province to the south of Eretz Israel. That's called Mount Seir, the series of mountains. Mount Seir... In fact, the, uh, the Jordanian city of Petra, like some people like to go to Petra, it has, what, sculptures or something? It has, uh, what is that, rock formations? Something in Petra that uh, people like to, yeah. like to go see. Petra is said to be the ancestral capital in Mount Seir of, of Edom. And he describes coldness and indifference. <coughs> he says, I'll read you a pasuk here, Mechamas achicha Yaakov, from the violence that you perpetrated against your brother Yaakov, techatzcha busha, may shame and humiliation cover you. V'nichrata liolam, may you be cut off forever. Biyom amadcha mineged, the day that you stood from afar. Biyom shavos zarim chelo the day that strangers plundered the wealth of Yaakov. The Nachrim Bo Sharav, and the Nachri, the foreigner, came into the gates, the Al Yerushalayim Yadu Garau, and they cast lots over Yerushalayim, and you rejoiced. So it's interesting that in the first part, because there's kind of a historical survey here, in the first part, Edom is not criticized for the evil that it did to Yaakov. It is criticized for the indifference, and not just the indifference, but the joy that it experienced as the Jewish people were suffering. Now, in some ways, I have to admit, this is a little hard for me to get a grasp on because it would seem to me on some level it's almost human. I mean, if Esau had been wronged by Yaakov taking the brachas, and then hundreds of years later, Esav is witness to the Babylonians. <coughs> now this is after Avadja's time, but that's what he's talking about. The Babylonians plundering, then it might be quite natural for Esav to rejoice in what is happening to Yaakov as if to say, God is punishing you for what you did. Because in this part of the Haftarah, the Navi is not criticizing Esau for any actual bad things Esau did, but he's criticizing because how could you abandon your brother in time of need? Mm -hmm. Doesn't a brotherly relationship count for something? So again, it's a bit of a Torah I, I don't have a clear understanding myself of why are we so hard on Esau that he didn't love Yaakov enough to intervene to protect Yaakov. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Which means what? You are you, like, you one like one of them. You also yeah. joined in. You also joined in. Okay, it depends how you translate it. In other words, uh, some translate it that that refers to the punishment, and you will be punished. So, so, so it depends. I, if it actually means you joined in, then I think you're right. We're saying that you were not just a spectator, you were an active, an active participant. And by the way, I want to point out too, the Abarbanel points out that these references to Nadim are very much the, uh, in other words, it's not just a single thing. On one hand, it's referring to the Corbin bias reshown in the hands of the Babylonians, but it also refers to the Christian, because remember, there is a concept which appears in Chazal and is certainly taken up by many, many Mephorshim, that the Christian church, particularly the Catholic church, which was situated in Rome, is considered to be a spiritual successor of Asa because the Catholic Church succeeded, so to speak, the Roman Empire. And you know that uh, it was the position of the Catholic Church until relatively recently that all of the exile of the Jews and the persecutions of the Jews are God's punishment because we crucified or we delivered for crucifixion Yashka. In fact, even during the Holocaust, there were there were Christian clergy who refused to intervene to help Jews. And not because they were endangering. That's one question. If you said it's dangerous, that's, yeah, okay. you know, that's, that's an excuse or something. But they actually said, what is happening to you is God's decree because of what you did. So in a sense, <coughs> there's a certain powerful contemporary you know, resonance here in which you stood by as everything was happening to Yaakov. And Hashem says, I'm not going to forgive the indifference, the coldness, and the joy that you take in the sufferings of your brother. Right? So it both refers to the first base of Mikdash, and it refers to the Christian theological position that whatever happens to the Jews is what's coming to them and we don't have to take any steps to alleviate their suffering. This was the theological justification for anti-Semitism. And as the Rabbanel says, Nevuos are layered. They refer to many, many different things. Now, towards the end, there's already a reference to the second Chorban, which will happen much later, in which it mentions you actively destroyed the temple. Right? But that's not the same event. That's in the year 70, when the Romans destroyed the, the base of Mikdash. Now, there, there's a, uh, I, already, I already mentioned the Pasuk to you that base Yosef will be a torch and base Esav will be straw and they will be burnt up, right? That's the reference the Gemara says that Amalek will fall by the hands of Rachel, uh, the children of Rachel, not the children of Leah. Uh, but then I just want to uh, show you uh, a Pasuk. If you look at the, or I'll read it, next to the last Pasuk, there's a very, very interesting reference to uh, the extent of the exile. And it's not clear historically what period it's referring to. Uh, it sounds like a Rav Chaim Kineski question. Uh, where is France mentioned in Tanakh? Where is Spain mentioned in Tanakh? The answer is in this Haftorah. The Pasuk says, the galus hacheel hazeh. This is in the... Uh, P- uh, Pasuk Yutes, verse 19, Avtara Uvajah, mm-hmm. Perik uh, Pasuk Yutes. Mm-hmm. The Galus, Hechel Hazeh, Livne Yisrael Asher Kenanim, Ad Sorfas, the Galus Yerushalayim Asher Bisfarad, Yarshu, Sare Hanegev. That this is a prophecy about the ultimate redemption, the ultimate Mashiach, the Shivat Zion, in which the Jewish people who have been exiled will come back to Eretz Israel and they will even settle the Arei Hanegev. This doesn't mean Ar Negev, this means further south. They will settle the territory of Edom, <coughs> as it were. And it mentions the Galus that goes all the way to Tsarfat. Now, what is Tsarfat? So, here we have a big machlokis of Mepharshim. The Malbim, somewhat modestly, simply says, Sorfat refers to a city uh, in the north of Eretz Israel. 
Not so far, so you should so far kid, you actually have that. But the Abai Benel says, Sarfat is France, as in modern Hebrew, it calls France, and Sofarad is Spain, <coughs> and it mentions already that for already from the time of the first Torban, the first Torban, the Rabbi Nel says, people make a mistake when they think that all the Jews were exiled to Babylonia, and then they went to Persia. No. It's a big mistake. At the time of the Gullit Babel, Jews were scattered all over the place and they had already come to Europe and they had come to Spain and they had come to France and in fact we even have later traditions again we're not sure if they're historically accurate in which when Ezra came from Eretz Israel to, to Bavel I'm sorry from Bavel to Eretz Israel and the second temple was going to be rededicated so messages were sent to Jewish communities in Germany already in Germany inviting them to come back and uh, one response was given you you know we have our little Yerushalayim here and you have your big Yerushalayim there and we will send donations but we're very very happy we've settled here which means actually that there are Ashkenazic communities or there were, there were Ashkenazi communities in France, in Germany, although Germany is not mentioned here, Spain, although we would call, I mean, calling, him, calling it Svardim, as we call it, is an anachronism because there wasn't a distinct Svardim then. But in terms of when Jews got to the Iberian Peninsula and when they got to France, is as early as, and maybe even earlier, but at least as early as the destruction of the first Beis Hamikdash. Quite amazing. The first Beis Hamikdash, the historical date that's given for the destruction of the first Beis Hamikdash is typically 586 BCE. Now, some say under Jewish chronology, you have to make it a little around 130 years later, because otherwise, it but even if you make it 130 years later, so you're talking about four, 450 BCE four centuries before the Common Era. And that is how old these communities were. Now, some say you actually had them from Shlomo HaMelech already. Okay, but that, that we don't necessarily have any proof for. Uh, in fact, this is interesting. Um, when the Babylonian Talmud was completed, the Gemara was completed around uh, the year in the 600, 7th seventh, seventh century, 600. And the Babylonian Talmud was sent to these communities in Europe some of them didn't want to accept it because they said, we have minhagim that are older than the Gemara. You know, the, the Gemara is, is innovating. Our minhagim are before. Hundreds of years we've been here. A thousand years. 586 BC to 600 coming in. It's, it's a thousand years. Right? So it's quite, quite amazing. So this Pusik is one of the references that the Barbanel and other Meforshim use for the presence of Jewish community. Of course, the Rabbinel was in Spain, and he uses this to show that the Jewish presence in Spain is extremely ancient, uh, dating from the Chorban of the, of the Beis HaMikdash. And then the Haftorah ends with a Pasuk that we actually say every day at the end of Az Yashir, but it's not, from the, it's not part of Az Yashir. It's after it says, V'yolu Moshiim Bahar Tzion eventually there will be saviors that will reclaim Mount Zion, which Mount, now Mount Zion here really means the Temple Mount. It's interesting. We have another mount called Mount Zion. Baruch Zion is the Makam HaMikdash. Lishpot es Esav and the mountains of Esav, this, which means the great ones of Esav, the leaders of Esav, shall be judged and held accountable for Haisa Lashem Hamlucha and then God's kingdom will be established. Let me just end with um, a very interesting horror of the Vilna Gaon. The Vilna Gaon says that there's a difference between Melech and Moshe. Both of them mean a ruler, a king. But a Melech is a king whose subjects have voluntarily accepted him out of awe and reverence and love. A Moshel is a ruler who imposes his rule on you without your acceptance, like a dictator. 
So that's why the Pasuk says earlier, Ki Lashem Hamlucha Umoshel Bagoyim. These are the, the nations of the world who don't accept Hashem. He is the Moshe. But for Am Yisrael, Hashem is the Melech. We accept Him. So, I think the Haftar is making the point that when the ultimate Mashiach comes and Hashem's glory is revealed in the world, the whole world will accept Hashem as Melech it will no longer be a Moshe. Uh, one final thing. Earlier in the Haftarah, it mentions that, you know, there's a reference to the various wars that will occur before Mashiach comes, but it says, Vahart Sion, Tia Pleita. There will be a remnant of Jews that will survive in Hart Sion, which is really Yushalayim. Vahaya Kodesh. And that remnant will be holy. Be your shoe, base Yaakov, ace Mo And the house of Yaakov shall inherit those who try to inherit them. So this passage was quoted. Now the Chafetz Chaim, uh, was once asked about. Uh, I'm trying to remember the country. Maybe it was World War One. World War One when when. Jews were trying to escape Europe. He died before World War II, but uh, they tried to escape Europe, go to Eretz Israel, but the truth of the matter is that it was very, very dangerous. And of course, even in World War II, we have a very similar situation where Hitler had Rommel. Uh, Rommel was conducting a North African campaign. And had he not run out of uh, uh, gas and, and supplies, it is very probable that he would have gone to uh, Eretz to Palestine and would have aggressively tried to get the Jewish population even there. That's how much Hitler wanted to uh, do it. So there was some concern that was expressed that maybe Jews shouldn't go to Eretz Israel because they're putting themselves in a dangerous environment. And this Pusik was quoted that, that no matter how dangerous the world is, no matter how dangerous Eretz Israel is, there will always be a pleita behind Sion. There will be the remnant in the Holy Land that God is going to protect. So, you know, one of the um, arguments people make sometimes, even today, is they don't want to make Aliyah because um, it's too dangerous to live here. <laughs> now, you know, it's kind of funny, funny in a sense, well, yeah, sure, uh, much more dangerous than Paris, and much more dangerous than London, and much more dangerous than New York. Uh, you know, the world is dangerous. And Eretz Israel has its share of danger, but comparatively speaking, uh, on a day-to-day level, it is actually a safer place to live than most of the world. But even if in theory it wouldn't be, uh, the problem is this. If you're living in a dangerous world anyway, then you might as well live dangerously here <laughs> instead of live dangerously somewhere else. Because there's a special protection. Yeah, I just had a comment because yeah. I was, uh, my relatives, all, all of my relatives are outside Jerusalem. Yes. And they're always wondering, or they thought about getting from, like, living around in Jerusalem. So they said, like, oh, it's so dangerous. When well, you say outside of Jerusalem, are they in Israel or are they in Israel? Oh, in Israel. And they feel Jerusalem is more dangerous. Well, yeah. may, maybe traffic wise, you know, that, <laughs> <laughs> that I might agree with. <laughs> but, Baruch Hashem, I mean, you know, listen, I mean, obviously we have, we have Tsarath and, uh, the nature of it is that uh, we are a small country and a close-knit country and Jews care about Jews. So every time there's any pigula, it's something that affects us very, very deeply and, and we pray uh, that there should be shalom. But, but all in all, HaKadosh Baruch Hu's rachamim has been very, very great. And uh, the haftacha of the Navi, that in Har Tzion there will be plata, there will be the remnant that will flourish and survive and uh, be successful in, in many, many ways. Baruch Hashem, we, we have seen it in our, in our day, and God willing, it can only get better and better until the time that uh, we are Zoha to the Geula Shleim. <laughs> 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 Oh, we're not.